China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. I was a facilitator and then a participant in the first ever financial war game ever conducted by the Pentagon. We did this at a a top secret uh, location called the Warfare Analysis Laboratory. One of the things we did there, I was on the China team. I wanted to make it realistic. So I said, let's lie, cheat and steal because that's what Wall Street does. And that's that's a more realistic game. So I recruited a friend of mine who's fluent in Russian to be on the Russian team. And I had dinner with him before we went down to uh, to the laboratory. And I said, look, here's the plan. I'm, I'm going to persuade my China team colleagues to um, basically announce a, a new gold standard. And uh, we, we've accumulated enough gold and we're going to say for now and our currency is backed by gold. We're going to put the gold in Switzerland to keep everybody happy. We're going to issue notes from a, a bank created in London under, under English laws to keep everybody happy. Here's the thing. We're going to say from now on, if you want our exports, you have to pay for us in this new currency. We're not taking dollars anymore. And furthermore, and if you want some of this new currency, you can do you can deposit your gold in Switzerland and the bank will issue you some currency so you're in the system. Or you can trade with us and run a surplus and then we'll pay you in the currency and you can use that to buy our stuff or we'll give you loans. But one way or another, we're done with the dollar. And obviously this is very forward leaning, but the whole idea of a war game is to help the Pentagon think five or 10 years ahead. So the first thing that happened when these, you go to your embassy, your conclave, you, you come out and you stand up at the podium, you announce your plans, and then everybody reacts and it's discussed, et cetera. The first thing that happened is there was a group. So we had the, you had the red team, the yellow team, the blue team, as the case may be, and they're all different countries or areas. But there's a white team, which are the referees. They decide what you did. And the first thing they did when we announced the gold move, they ruled it as an illegal move. They said, no. No, that's not in any of our scenarios. You can't do that. And I stood up, and about 100 people in the room, they're three star generals, CIA, FBI. You know, I said, wait a minute. I said, this is a war. There are no illegal moves in a war. The whole idea is to be out of the box or live in a world where there are no boxes. That's what we're doing here. So they agreed. They said, okay, we, we think it's a really dumb idea, but we'll let you do it. Well, Over the course of two days, it accelerated and gathered momentum. At the end of it, Russia got PowerPoints. Okay, so this was 2009. Within 10 years, so so what were the what facts happened? Within 10 years, Russia tripled its gold reserves. Uh, Last week, the dollar value of Russia's gold exceeded the dollar value of its treasury securities. They have 20% of their reserves in gold, and their the value of their gold is more than the value of the U.S. Treasury securities. They're dumping treasuries buying gold. Exactly what we warned the Pentagon about 10 years ago. Um, and here it is in China has more than tripled its reserves. So we're not there yet, but we're moving to some kind of gold back world. But the point is, that was all in the war game. That's all in the book. And I made one other point. I said, Currency wars don't happen all the time. They might only happen twice in a century. But when they happen, they can last for 10 or 15 years. That's how long it takes to sort out. What you describe about the Chinese money supply is absolutely correct. People in the United States complain, oh, the Federal Reserve has printed $4 trillion in the past year. And they have. They have printed $4 trillion in the last year. They're taking the Fed balance sheet from about... 3.5 3.5 trillion to 7.5 trillion. So yeah, we printed $4 trillion in the past year. Didn't do any good, won't do any good, but we did it. Uh, but Chinese money supply is even larger and growing faster. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds on China's internal monetary policy. I could, except to say that they're grossly over leveraged. The economy is investment driven, not consumption driven. They're about 40%, 45% investment. The US is about 25% investment. So that gives you some idea of how much, how investment is to the Chinese, which is actually okay if you're investing in productive assets that pay the way. They're not. They're wasting the money. I've, I've been to China many times, been going back and forth there for uh, 35 years. Um, I've been out in the countryside. I don't just stick to the hotel lobby in Beijing. I got mud on my boots visiting these ghost cities. And um, so each ghost city, there are a bunch of them, actually seven of them. Imagine building seven cities. That's what I saw. And so they got one or two skyscrapers and they got mixed use and they got retail shopping, a country club, a hotel, a golf course, a pond, highway stops, airport, et cetera. And it's all empty. I mean, it's all empty. Shiny new construction, some of it still under construction, um, all empty. So I said to the communists, I said, 
what are you guys doing here? I mean, no, nobody's here. So, oh, don't worry, don't worry. People will be coming from the countryside. They will be populating these cities. And uh, I said, when? I said, no one's coming. And uh, besides that, you've already drained the countryside. That already happened. But I said, you cannot mothball a building. It's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time, today it's the Congo, I was in Kinshasa, but it was right after the 70s commodities boom. And they took the money, of course they wasted it and they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. But there's a skyscraper, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might've looked nice the day they built it, but it was never really used. And now it was literally when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's gonna happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime, maybe never. And I'll tell you why, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% sliced down at the bottom. And China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. They're treasury bills, notes, and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in. Uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers, you need auctions, you need payment and clearance systems, you need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issued trading, uh, you know, custodians, the rule of law. There's a whole massive infrastructure which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, you know, advising George Washington, and we've been doing it ever since. And others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. Um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency, none. Same with the Russian ruble, same with a lot of other currencies, same with Bitcoin. There's no, show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it. You write op-eds. You're pro fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. And they're not going to be a global reserve currency. So we can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States. The first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed $4 trillion. Congress, we had trillion dollar, what are called baseline budget deficits going into the pandemic. So with no pandemic, we were going to have a trillion dollar deficit in 2020 and 2021. Now, Congress put $3 trillion on top of that 
with rescue and bailout programs last uh, March, April, and May. That was the CARES program, payroll protection plan, um, aid to hospitals, uh, uh, extended unemployment benefits, higher unemployment benefits, et cetera. And I'm not saying any of those things were bad. It was needed uh, to keep things from getting a lot worse. But we put $3 trillion on top of this. So there's $4 trillion for fiscal 2020. They just did a trillion last week uh, in the kind of final days of the Trump administration. So that's five trillion. And Biden has announced his plan. He's going to have a two trillion dollar rescue bailout so-called stimulus plan now. So that's seven trillion dollars plus the trillion dollar baseline for fiscal 2021. So there's eight trillion dollars in deficit spending in two fiscal years, four trillion dollars of money printing by the Fed. Now, those are the numbers. That's not. That's not projections. That that's baked in the pie. Just don't call it stimulus. It will have no stimulative effect. Does it again? As I say, keep the lights on. Yes. Did would it, would just some people keep their jobs last spring because their employer got payroll protection plans? Yes. Did other people benefit from increased unemployment benefits? Yes. Was a lot of that necessary because things were in such bad shape? Yes. So I'm not arguing that side of it, but it does not stimulate. It's not going to get us out of the depression. Let me be very specific as to why, because I don't like to, I don't make claims without backing it up. On the money supply, you can print all the money you want, but Milton Friedman was wrong, the monetarists are wrong, the Austrian school is wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is something called velocity, which is the turnover of money. The money has to be lent and spent. Banks have to be lenders. People and businesses have to be borrowers. You have to be spending it. Get it in circulation, in other words, in order to potentially to have some inflation. Uh, and that's the technical name for that is velocity. Velocity is dropping, sinking like a stone. By the way, it's been dropping since 1998. It dropped faster in the 2008 crisis. It's dropping faster today. But the trend has been very steeply down for the last 22 years. Um, and so the you know, nominal GDP, so the, the, the dollar value of all goods and services, leaving aside inflation, that's, that's what we mean by nominal value. Nominal value of gross domestic product is money supply times velocity. How much money is there and how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other and that's your nominal GDP. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. Meaning you can print the $7 trillion, but if you don't have any velocity, you don't have an economy. And so you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and declining velocity. One offsets the other so that you barely keep nominal GDP where it is. In fact, it's going to go down about 6 or 7%. We're not getting back to 2000. 19 levels of output. If you take 2019 as your baseline, we're not getting back to 2019 levels till 2023 at the earliest. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of job creation, the number of people who have jobs until 2025 at the earliest. That's why I call it a depression, not a recession. Now flip over to fiscal policies like, hey, they're sending everybody $2,000 checks. And they are, the people are going to get those checks. And so the, the Wall Street, which you know usually gets things wrong, that's the first thing you got to know about Wall Street, because they don't really care about you. They care about rap fees and how they make money. So they're saying, all right, they're going to send out the $2,000 checks and people are going to get those checks and they're going to run right out and they're going to buy a car, a refrigerator, you know, paint the kitchen, whatever it may be. No, the first two things are true. They're going to spend the money and they're going to, sorry, they're going to borrow the money and they're going to send people the checks. But when people get the checks, they're not spending it. What they're doing, they're saving it. They're, they're either paying down debt, which is equivalent to savings, or they're putting the money in the bank, which is savings. So certainly if you lost your job, you're not going to take your friends out to dinner. You're going to throw the money in the bank or pay the rent. Uh, but even if you didn't lose your job, you look around like maybe your spouse lost his job. Maybe um, your neighbor lost his job. Maybe you think you're next, like you have a job, but you're worried you're going to get fired next week. So you save it. And, and the, the name for that, economists call that precautionary savings or, you know, plain English, it's, it's saving for a rainy day, except it's raining everywhere. So, so they are going to, they are going to, send the checks out, but people aren't going to spend it. And that's the reason you're not going to get the stimulative effect, but you are going to increase the deficit, which gets back to this debt to GDP ratio. So take the total debt divided by GDP. And that's, that's some ratio. The research is very convincing, very clear. A number of studies show this, that up to about 90%, so 90% debt to GDP, you get a little bit of something called a, a, Keynesian, a Keynesian multiplier, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, 
and you get a dollar ten of GDP, or you get a dollar five of GDP, and it works maybe temporarily, but it works when people won't spend the money the government can. That's the idea. But when the debt to GDP GDP ratio goes above 90%. That's what physicists call a critical threshold or a phase transition. Now you're through the looking glass. Now the Keynesian multiplier drops below one, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you only get 90 cents of GDP. But meanwhile, the debt went up a dollar. So what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? This is going up dollar for dollar, but this is going up 90 cents on the dollar. So the ratio is getting worse. Guess what the US debt to GDP ratio is today? The answer is it's about 135%. So we're way past that 90% threshold. And by the way, who's in that club? I can tell you, Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. So there's your lunch table for four, you know, the four super debtors league. And it just gets worse. And that G, that ratio past 90% is a headwind to growth because people look at it and like, hey, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I just don't like what I see. And people understand correctly. And this is the behavioral adaptation that policymakers on Wall Street do not understand. But the, the, the behavioral ad, adaptations people look at and say, you know, I don't know how this is going to end, but it's going to end. I'm either going to, we're either going to have a default or we're going to have something like hyperinflation to make the debt go away, or they're going to raise my taxes. Not sure which, maybe all of the above, but I, I have to save more money to meet my lifetime goals in the face of some bad outcome that's going to come out of this. That's the real world behavior. And economists know very little about the real world. So, um, so the point is, Increasing the money supply doesn't work because velocity is declining. Increasing deficits doesn't work because people are saving, not spending, and they're preparing for worse outcomes. So neither one of these, you can call it money printing or spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate. We're not getting out of this. And that's why I call my book, The New Great Depression. So 90% is the critical threshold. The US is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever is the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down, but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the US debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. With some exceptions, but they they kind of like you know an inch a year, a couple inches a year. But they but they move mountains. I mean, they just they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but it applies to any country. I focus on the, the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. And a simple example, if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least default on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you know, you just write a check. It's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not, unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The U S just hit a uh, $31 trillion in uh, in national debt, that is national debt, almost all of it in the form of U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly U.S. Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130%. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30%. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions, no big deal. 30% um, is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. 
uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Maastricht Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do, you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or, or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. If you, uh, you say, what's the critical threshold where, you know, water turns to steam or, you know, water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same. It's, it's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The, the, best, the, the best research says the answer is 90%. And this comes out of, you know, Ken Rogoff at uh, Harvard, also Carmen Reinhardt, who's now the uh, chief economist at the World Bank, but they've looked at uh, hundreds of cases over hundreds of years. And I like that because it's not just, you know, kind of cherry picking data, uh, developed economies, developing economies, uh, economies that issue debt in their own currencies, ones that issue debt in other currencies, principally U.S. dollars, et cetera. So, you know, a wide variety of case studies. And they show that not, when you when your debt to G, GDP ratio goes over 90 percent, your your multiplier of an additional debt uh, of additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context at, at 30%, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar 30 of growth, you know, assuming you spend it wisely. That's a, that's a big condition, but uh, you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar 30 of growth. Okay. The debt was productive. If you, if you put it to good use, uh, but that that dollar thirty gets smaller and smaller. As you get closer to ninety percent, it goes to a dollar twenty, a dollar ten, a dollar five. Past ninety percent, you know, roughly, uh, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar, and you only get ninety five cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then ninety percent and eighty five percent, et cetera. So ninety percent is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at one hundred and thirty one percent, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, you know, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of uh, modern monetary theory. She's a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter that, uh, you know, she, they always point to Japan. Japan is at uh, 280%, um, way past any, any member of the peer group. Um, China's probably higher. China's a little more opaque because, well, because they are, but also they they don't have as much national debt. If you, if you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of, of provincial debt. And the banks, the banking system is is owned by the government or controlled by the government. So when you throw in when you throw in the bank debt, the state-owned enterprises, the provincial debt and the and the government. So that's the real national debt. Kelton says, uh, Stephanie Kelton says, uh, it doesn't matter um, because you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentina and you borrow in dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have, you know, huge trade surpluses, which they don't. So they just default, you know, Argentina is a serial defaulter and everyone expects that. If you um, borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Uh, Well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. Uh, what about uh, inflation or hyperinflation? Um, what about uh, the foreign exchange rate? Uh, you know, the exchange rate can collapse. And the, these modern monetary theorists um, show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. I mean, if it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning $1 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do. Um, and they, they don't, they're just not very knowledgeable about any of those things. But you can think of exchange rates as a conveyor belt. Exchange rates are one way the problems go from one country to another, or good things can go from one country to another, uh, depending on whether your exchange rate is going up or down, the impact on terms of trade, et cetera. But they, they completely ignore all that. They also ignore the role of commercial banks. They, they just look at the Treasury and the Fed and look at money supply, but like kind of M0, 
but don't understand how commercial banks create M1 and they do their own thing. They're not uh, they're not on as short a leash as as they seem to think. But but it, you know, if you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she says, well, we don't really need a bond market, U.S. bond market. Uh, we only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. Uh, but why, you know, why have, um, you know, he said, yeah, government spending. So the Treasury borrows money by issuing bonds, and then the Fed monetizes the bonds by buying the bonds, and that gives the Treasury the money to pay the bills, et cetera. She says, do away with all that. Just give the Fed, you know, wire instructions for Lockheed. And if you need five F-35 fighter jets, order them and just send the money right to Lockheed. Why do you need a bond market? I mean, she actually says that. So, okay, it kind of... I mean, legally, that might be possible, but to suggest that you can do that without consequences is nonsense. And they say, what about inflation? Uh, well, she, their view is as long as there's excess capacity and unmet needs, et cetera, you know, you're not going to have inflation because there's a lot of slack in the economy. Well, that's a legitimate debate. But what they say when inflation happens, raise taxes. Um, and the, by the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes? And their answer is, we collect taxes to redistribute income. Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. Uh, but, but it's important to bear in mind that Stephanie was the principal economic advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. And Bernie Sanders today is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, controls the purse strings. So um, coming out of Congress and Biden's kind of a cipher, he's, you know, he's barely aware of his own existence. So uh, Sanders is in a powerful position and she's she's the, the Bernie whisperer, so to speak, who's behind all this. So uh, if you ask the typical member of Congress, can you define modern monetary theory? They'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means. MMT, you know. But they're acting as they're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior of the Congress, and again, just go back to COVID 2020, because we talked about the debt to GDP ratio. So in um, around May or June um, 2020, Trump put through a, um, a one, sorry, a $2 trillion covid relief package and that was when you know the the, pay, the paycheck protection plan that was 800 billion and everyone got the the 1200 check you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then at the end of december at the very end of the trump administration they did another trillion dollars uh, almost uh and that's when everyone got the 600 dollar checks and now you're up, up to 1800 dollars uh, by the way those checks that is helicopter money um that's you know what the fed does is is kind of nonsense, but when it's fiscal policy, not monetary policy, and you're handing out checks, that is helicopter money. And credit to Larry Summers for saying you're going to get inflation out of this. Well, Biden comes into office in January 2021, and he's like, not to be outdone. He did his own COVID relief package. That was another two trillion dollars, and that's when we all got the fourteen hundred dollar checks. They just handed them out, and then later that year, uh, or they did the. Um, trillion dollar infrastructure package. And then just to top it off, we what did we get recently was the, um, the uh, just under a trillion dollar Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Well, and the baseline budget deficit, before everything I just described, the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year. So take a trillion dollars for 2020, 2021, and, and 2022, add on you know two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for a second one, uh, two trillion for Biden's first package, one trillion for the Green New Scam, and I think a trillion for infrastructure. That's seven trillion dollars on top of the two trillion dollar baseline budget deficit. So that's nine trillion dollars piled on top of what was at the time um, about a, a twenty one trillion dollar national debt. So that's how we got to thirty trillion. That's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. These numbers are mind boggling and MMT says doesn't matter, but it does matter. And it, it shows up the way I described earlier, which is it, it slows growth. You don't get growth. So best case for the US is very slow, weak growth, which we saw from 2009 to 2019. Worst case is you throw a recession on top of that, which we're heading for, uh, and the US will be in fiscal distress. 
The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8, 9, 10% or, or more. The US had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a trillion dollars per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre pandemic. The Congress threw $3 trillion of emergency aid on top of that. And I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the, the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled $3 trillion on top. Now, this is going to take the U.S. debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator yeah. and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. If you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get if you get them right, um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy, starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, et cetera. So um, human nature doesn't change, or at least it hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one, an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, so what? So the G debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. Who cares? What's wrong with it? 180%. We got issues. We got problems. Print up the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What What is the problem? Uh, this this comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed. It's wrong. But it's it's got its followers, and those followers are now in the White House because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. They take the view that if the Treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? That's ridiculous, but that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they they um, build aircraft. They have benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the Treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be, that that's the, the real source of money. They also take the treasury and the fed and they merge them. Now that's not legally the case. The treasury and the fed are separate institutions. Oh. The treasury is just part of the executive branch. Uh, and the fed is an independent agency. Uh, and the federal reserve banks are actually privately owned. Uh, a lot of people know, some people know that some people don't, but the, the federal reserve banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so of Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate, but, but the theorists ignore that and say, no, um, the treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have, you borrow to cover it, you issue bonds to cover the borrowing. And if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free healthcare, free childcare, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2, or sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And like, look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is, this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it, but uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain why. Explain that uh, up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. 
It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay it on debt. When you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You you hoard cash. Or people were buying gold. They were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand, and the banks were not lending. So um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must. The government can borrow. The government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar fifty of GDP. Uh, now, there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward. But so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think a little Einstein, I mean, because of the general theory of relativity, but um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, and get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, et cetera. So now not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff, more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. Uh, how could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll give it. I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point. Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what? But what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right. The more you borrow, it's actually a headwind to growth. Now you get le just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more. Oh, sorry, it, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good. Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo. They're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying, no, this is bad, and it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. The economy is in a huge mess. Jim Rickard said that this is the best single indicator of a recession. An inverse yield curve is when a yield on a 30-year bond is lower than a 10-year bond. Simply put, you get more money by saving it in less time. Normally, you should get more money when you save it for longer because the risk is bigger. You have to wait for more time in order to get your money back. But instead, investors prefer the shorter bond because they're afraid that the economy might be in a recession, meaning that the economy is slowing down. Jim Rickard said that there are at least three markets, the stock market, the bond market, and the real market. 
If the economy is in a recession, stocks and bond markets usually know it later, but the real market knows it first. When the sales go down, they have to cut costs. And eventually, they have to fire their employees. Entrepreneurs and small businesses know it best when it comes to the state of the economy because I believe that Jerome Powell never bought groceries by himself. So, how could interest rates go up if we are in a recession? The fact is that the interest rate is a lagging indicator. Let Jim Rickards explain it to you. Interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. They see it. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, there's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material adverse clause, clause adverse change clauses kicking in and said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then, then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loss. And then interest rates will start to come down. But the interest rates peak after the recession be, has already begun. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks. Bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then there's what I call the reality. What I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're, they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over-tightened. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, attention spans seem to be short these days, but it wasn't that long ago. Go back and look at, look at a chart, uh, any stock index chart from October 1st, 2018 to, to December 24th, 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%, culminating in the Christmas Eve massacre, December 24th, 2018, when it dropped, I think NASDAQ dropped like 3% in one day. Now, here's the point the Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre and after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly, but not just because they're going down. Jim Rickard said that the Federal Reserve will only care enough if it's a disorderly collapse, meaning if the markets, either stocks or bonds, are going down like 30% in just two weeks. If it's just a little plunge in a day like a 5% drop in Amazon stocks then the Fed won't care about it. But what the Fed and everybody is missing is the state of the economy itself. The unemployment rate is at its worst now, and massive layoffs in the tech industry are in the news everywhere. Because of what, you might ask? Yes, you are correct, it's because of the high interest rates. The companies need to pay more for the interest on their debt, so they have to reduce their headcount. 
At the same time, their revenue decreased because consumers unsubscribed from their services because of the rising prices everywhere, whether it's groceries, gas, or even food. So yeah, everything will go south, I guess. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Unemployment likes the business sector. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, you know, you know, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. Um, and then by the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. So that, and then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. We know enough right now to know that number's going up this spring. But that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. Now, having said that, what else is the Fed missing? Well, wages are up 5% yeah. on an annualized basis, 5.2% on an annualized basis. I'm like, yeah, and inflation's 7% or 6%. So your real wage just went down one or two points. Because when, when, the, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports those wage numbers, those are nominal numbers. I'm not saying they're fake. But you have to know that they're nominal and you have to subtract inflation to find out what's happening to real wages. And the answer is real wages have been going down for a couple of years because um, they're, they're, it runs around 5% annualized, give or take. Sounds like a hey, 5% raise, what, what do you want? Well, yeah, but with 8 9% inflation or even 6% inflation, um, your real wage is going down. So that's not a, a robust number at all. The Fed, by the way, the Fed wants to make, make it worse. The Fed agrees that uh, those wage gains are too high. But my point is, in real terms, they're actually going down, but the Fed wants them to go down more. That, that's, that would be one way to put it. If you get inflation down and, and wages are constant, then the real wage goes up relative to where it was before. Uh, but if you're unemployed, you have no wage. So that's that's another issue. Now, what the Fed is missing, and it's a long list, but uh, there's something called the labor force participation rate. Now, the labor force participation rate, you just take the number of people working divided by the total working age population. It's all, it's all you do. It's not sophisticated. Um, and that number today is around 61.2, uh, 61 give or take, uh, percent. But as recently as um, 2000, that, that number was over 70%. Uh, and it has come down ever since, and it's, it dropped like a stone during uh, 2020, during the pandemic lockdown. Came back a little bit, but not much. The reason it got, first of all, it's never 100%. It shouldn't be. There are legitimate reasons to be working age population and not working. You're um, you're a homemaker. You're a, a student. Yeah, you know, there's there's a bunch of perfectly good reasons. So it's never 100%, not even close. But 70 is pretty high and 60 is pretty low. Uh, so and the, the trend has been down. So that leaves uh, relative to kind of a normalized number that leaves about eight to 10 million people between the ages of 25 and 54 who are not in the workforce. There's a big untapped labor pool. But if you throw if you took that group and threw it into the unemployment numbers, the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates it, unemployment would be about nine percent. And yes. that's a, that's a depression level of unemployment etc and it's all empty I mean, this is all empty shiny new construction some of it's still under construction um all empty so i said to the communists i said what are you guys doing here i mean no, nobody's here said, oh don't worry don't worry people will be coming from the countryside and they will be populating these cities and uh i said when i said no one's coming and uh besides that you've already drained the countryside that already happened but i said you cannot mothball a building it's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time, today it's the Congo, I was in Kinshasa, but it was right after the 70s commodities boom. And they took the money, of course they wasted it and they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. But there's a skyscraper, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might've looked nice the day they built it, but 
it was never really used. And now it was literally when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's going to happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime, maybe never. And I'll tell you why, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% sliced down at the bottom. And China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. The treasury bills, notes, and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in. Uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers, you need auctions, you need payment and clearance systems, you need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issued trading, uh, you know, custodians, the rule of law. There's a whole massive infrastructure which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, you know, advising George Washington, and we've been doing it ever since. And others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't ch trust the Chinese as far as you can as throw them. Um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency, none. Same with the Russian ruble, same with a lot of other currencies, same with Bitcoin. There's no, show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it. You write op-eds. You put fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. And they're not going to be a global reserve currency. So we can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States, the first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed $4 trillion. Congress, we had trillion dollar, what are called baseline budget deficits going into the pandemic. So with no pandemic, we were going to have a trillion dollar deficit in 2020 and 2021. Now, Congress put $3 trillion on top of that with rescue and bailout programs last uh, March, April, and May. That was the CARES program, payroll protection plan, um, aid to hospitals, uh, uh, extended unemployment benefits, higher unemployment benefits, et cetera. And I'm not saying any of those things were bad. It was needed uh, to keep things from getting a lot worse. But we put $3 trillion on top of this. So there's $4 trillion for fiscal 2020. They just did a trillion last week uh, in the kind of final days of the Trump administration. So that's five trillion. And Biden has announced his plan. He's going to have a two trillion dollar rescue bailout so-called stimulus plan now. So that's seven trillion dollars plus the trillion dollar baseline for fiscal 2021. So there's eight trillion dollars in deficit spending in two fiscal years, four trillion dollars of money printing by the Fed. Now, those are the numbers. That's not. That's not projections, that, that's baked in the pie. 
just don't call it stimulus. It will have no stimulative effect. Does it, again, as I say, keep the lights on? Yes. Did, would, it, would just some people keep their jobs last spring because their employer got payroll protection plans? Yes. Did other people benefit from increased unemployment benefits? Yes. Was a lot of that necessary because things were in such bad shape? Yes. So I'm not arguing that side of it, but it does not stimulate. It's not going to get us out of the depression. Let me be very specific as to why, because I don't like to, I don't make claims without backing it up. On the money supply, you can print all the money you want, but Milton Friedman was wrong. The monetarists are wrong. The Austrian school is wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is something called velocity, which is the turnover of money. The money has to be lent and spent. Banks have to be lenders. People and businesses have to be borrowers. You have to be spending it, get it in circulation, in other words, in order to potentially to have some inflation. Uh, and that's the technical name for that is velocity. Velocity is dropping, sinking like a stone. And by the way, it's been dropping since 1998. It dropped faster in the 2008 crisis. It's dropping faster today. But the trend has been very steeply down for the last 22 years. Um, and so the you know, nominal GDP, so the, the, the dollar value of all goods and services, leaving aside inflation, that's, that's what we mean by nominal value. Nominal value of gross domestic product is money supply times velocity. How much money is there and how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other and that's your nominal GDP. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. Meaning you can print the $7 trillion, but if you don't have any velocity, you don't have an economy. And so you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and declining velocity. One offsets the other so that you barely keep nominal GDP where it is. In fact, it's going to go down about 6 or 7%. We're not getting back to 2000. 19 levels of output. If you take 2019 as your baseline, we're not getting back to 2019 levels till 2023 at the earliest. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of job creation, the number of people who have jobs until 2025 at the earliest. That's why I call it a depression, not a recession. Now flip over to fiscal policies like, hey, they're sending everybody $2,000 checks. And they are, the people are going to get those checks. And so the, the Wall Street, which you know usually gets things wrong, that's the first thing you got to know about Wall Street, because they don't really care about you. They care about rap fees and how they make money. So they're saying, all right, they're going to send out the $2,000 checks and people are going to get those checks and they're going to run right out. And they're going to buy a car, a refrigerator, you know, paint the kitchen, whatever it may be. No, the first two things are true. They're going to spend the money and they're going to, sorry, they're going to borrow the money and they're going to send people the checks. But when people get the checks, they're not spending it. What they're doing, they're saving it. They're, they're either paying down debt, which is equivalent to savings, or they're putting the money in the bank, which is savings. So certainly if you lost your job, you're not going to take your friends out to dinner. You're going to throw the money in the bank or pay the rent. Uh, but even if you didn't lose your job, you look around like maybe your spouse lost his job. Maybe um, your neighbor lost his job. Maybe you think you're next, like you have a job, but you're worried you're going to get fired next week. So you save it. And, and the, the name for that, economists call that precautionary savings or, you know, plain English, it's, it's saving for a rainy day, except it's raining everywhere. So, so they are going to, they are going to, send the checks out, but people aren't going to spend it. And that's the reason you're not going to get the stimulative effect, but you are going to increase the deficit, which gets back to this debt to GDP ratio. So take the total debt divided by GDP. And that's, that's some ratio. The research is very convincing, very clear. A number of studies show this, that up to about 90%, so 90% debt to GDP, you get a little bit of something called a, a, Keynesian, a Keynesian multiplier, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get a dollar ten of GDP, or you get a dollar five of GDP. And it works maybe temporarily, but it works when people won't spend the money the government can. That's the idea. But when the debt to GDP GDP ratio goes above 90%. That's what physicists call a critical threshold or a phase transition. Now you're through the looking glass. Now the Keynesian multiplier drops below one, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you only get 90 cents of GDP. But meanwhile, the debt went up a dollar. So what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? This is going up dollar for dollar, but this is going up 90 cents on the dollar. So the ratio is getting worse. Guess what the US GD debt to GDP ratio is today? The answer is it's about 135%. So we're way past that 90% threshold. And by the way, who's in that club? I can tell you, Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. So there's your lunch table for four, you know, the four super debtors league. 
And it just gets worse. And that G, that ratio past 90% is a headwind to growth because people look at it and like, hey, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I just don't like what I see. And people understand correctly, and this is the behavioral adaptation that policymakers on Wall Street do not understand. But the, the, the behavioral ad, adaptations people look at say, you know, I don't know how this is going to end, but it's going to end. I'm either going to, we're either going to have a default or we're going to have something like hyperinflation to make the debt go away, or they're going to raise my taxes. Not sure which, maybe all of the above, but I, I have to save more money to meet my lifetime goals in the face of some bad outcome that's going to come out of this. That's the real world behavior. And economists know very little about the real world. So, um, so the point is, increasing the money supply doesn't work because velocity is declining. Increasing deficits doesn't work because people are saving, not spending, and they're preparing for worse outcomes. So neither one of these, you can call it money printing or spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate. We're not getting out of this. And that's why I call my book, The New Great Depression. The people ask me, are we going to have a recession? And my answer is we might be in a recession right now and not even know it. Uh, we could be facing a global recession, including China, but just focusing on the U.S. because uh, that's the Fed's sort of territory. So Powell saying, you know, the economy is great is, is nonsense. What he said, he said, you know, by the end of the year, we could be looking at 4.2% unemployment, 35 to 4% interest rates. And, you know, kind of 2.7% inflation. And you're like, wait a second, inflation is 8.6 today. How do you get to, you know, 2.7, number one? And then what about rising unemployment and, um, uh, and, and uh, higher interest rates? How do you reconcile those things? He said all three of those things. But what state of the world could make those things come true? There's only one, which is a recession. A recession would do it. A recession will raise unemployment. Higher interest rates will cause the recession, and the recession will cause inflation to go down. So, in effect, Powell was saying we're going to have a recession. Inflation, yeah, prices go up, so we understand that. Or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called, not to get too technical, but it's called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. If there, and we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. U.S. really started it, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Um, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. And you're exactly right. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors, so they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The other source of inflation is called um, demand pull. And this is when individuals, you, me, and all of our viewers, and you know, everyday Canadians and Americans, worry about inflation. We say, well, you know, I'm just thinking about buying a refrigerator. Better buy it now before the price goes up with a car, house, or whatever it, it might be. They're different, but they affect each other. When, when, the, when the cost push inflation from the supply side has enough effect, there's a tipping point or critical threshold in, in psychology. We say, you know, maybe it is out of control. I better go buy some stuff. Then the velocity of money goes up and then you get inflation. So the Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. And you're right about that. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand uh, and behavioral, and that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. Now, the question, of course, is can they do it? The answer is they can do it, but at what cost? So a general rule of thumb, this is really simple. You have to get, uh, forget about nominal interest rates. Nominal interest rates are the rates you see on your screen, you hear about the headlines and all that. Real interest rates are nominal interest rates minus inflation. Take the inflation out and see what's left. Well, right now, real interest rates are about 2%, actually one, one and three quarters under the Fed's policy rate. Inflation is 8.6%. So, you know, just round numbers, one and a half minus uh, eight and a half, uh, that's, uh, that makes the inflation rate negative seven. It's nowhere near. It's got to be positive two. Real rates have to be plus two to, to squash inflation. Right now, they're negative seven. So that implies that the Fed has to raise interest rates to 10.5% to get to 
positive to real interest rates. That's never going to happen. They're never going to get there. They will destroy the economy long before they get there. So the Fed has no hope of squashing inflation from the demand side, as you described, by raising rates, unless inflation comes down for other reasons. So what they're going to do, they're going to keep raising rates, you know, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, hope that inflation comes down from eight to maybe three, although I think that's a stretch. You could get into positive real rate territory, but they're really far away from it. So I think, by the way, I, I, I described what they're trying to do. I should make it clear they're going to fail. They, they, the, only way, the only way inflation comes down the way we're talking about is if they trash the economy, a severe recession. If that happens, yeah, you say, well, do you, people still need to put gas in their cars. Well, you're right, but not if they're unemployed because they're not going to work. There's a lot here that's just for show. It sounds good on TV, but um, the, there's a lot less here than we see that. But the point is, this is not over anytime soon. And even if it were, when you break supply chains, you can't just put them back together. It's like breaking a vase in a thousand pieces, and you've got to go buy a new vase. It's going to take years to undo this damage. So I spoke to the individual who was probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. It was 30 years from 1989 to 2019. Uh, it was headed one of the largest companies in the world, and this is what they did, among other things. Uh, and he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. It took us three years to blow it up. It's not going to come back in a year. This is going to take 5, 10, 15 years to build a new one. So, so what, it's what I call supply chain 2.0. Well, buying a refrigerator is a good idea. Buying a freezer might be a better idea. We're looking for food shortages by the fall. Now, when I say food shortages in Africa and Middle East, this will mean mass starvation. You may see the greatest humanitarian crisis in history because they literally can't get the food. Everyone's like, well, gee, you can't get Ukrainian weight, uh, wheat. What's the big deal? Buy it from somewhere else. There is, no, there is nowhere else. Canada and the United States grow an enormous amount of wheat, but we use most of it internally and uh, we feed because it's not for humans by the way we feed our animals so this is how you feed cows pigs this is how you get beef and pork this is an example of the supply chain how it filters all the way through so you would expect higher prices to persist you would expect food shortages uh, buying a freezer is not a bad idea um, and um, the future supply chain is going to be the it goes by different names uh, Janet Yellen calls it friendshoring uh, Macron calls it uh, constellation uh, I call it the College of Nations, but basically we'll have supply chains and trade, but it'll be sort of members only. So U.S., Canada, Australia, Europe, others, Japan, uh, will be invited to join, but not China. You know, Russia is going to be in the waiting room for a while. We, sh we should be better allies of Russia, but the, the, the Democrats in the United States have pretty much made that impossible, at least for the short run. Uh, and then there'll be other countries that are kind of neutral in, in that scheme, you know, Brazil, India, and others. But the point is you'll still have trade and you'll have supply chains, but it'll be kind of friendly countries, members only, uh, and exclude China. So that decoupling is going to go ahead. The Chinese seem to be not only fine with it, but they're actually leading the way. Uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is moving back to the United States. Um, you know, the 20 billion of uh, new semiconductor plants from Intel. And why is Taiwan Semiconductor spending over $5 billion to build new semiconductor fabrication plants in the United States? Well, obviously, because they're worried about China. We're reshuffling the deck, but it, none of this stuff is easy. I mean, uh, semiconductor plants take five years to build a new refinery. Forget it. That's like seven to 10 years. We haven't had one in the United States since 1977. So it's going to take a while to do all this. Well, we can do it. So if I said we're definitely going to have inflation, you would know what to do. You'd buy gold, hard assets, land, silver, treasury notes, government bonds, etc. If I said we're definitely going to have deflation, you would also know what to do. You would uh, reduce leverage. You would uh, have more cash. Uh, and there are, other, there are other assets you could go into. The problem is we could have both. There's no question we have inflation right now. It's, it's, it's front and center. But if the Fed squashes it and causes a recession or worse, you could flip to deflation very quickly. So this is going to sound like a, 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 an obvious statement. What you want is diversification. Sounds obvious, but most people don't know what diversification is. I see people, I've got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. I'm highly diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You have one asset class called stocks. Real diversification, have a slight a slice of stocks, gold, real estate, cash, um, agriculture uh, is a good investment. Energy, forget you know, the green new scam. That's a joke. Uh, oil and natural gas are going to be around for a long time. 
I can tell you exactly what the Fed's going to do, and you can do this at home. So if listeners want to take notes, it's, it's really easy. First of all, what is the problem the Fed's trying to solve? What is their solution? And then what are the exceptions to that so that we can have a complete predictive analytic model? The problem they're trying to solve is the following. We know from a long series of experiences, you know, 30 or more business cycles since the end of World War II, that when the U.S. is in a recession, you have to cut interest rates 3 to 4% to get the U.S. out of a recession. You need 3 to 400 basis points of cuts to get the U.S. It's like a plane heading for the ground. How do you pull it out of a nosedive and get it back up in the sky? The answer is 300 basis points of cuts. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're only at 75 basis points? The answer is you can't. And forget about negative rates. The evidence is now pretty good that negative rates do not work. In other words, negative rates are not more of the same. When you go from, let's say, a half of 1%, and you go to a quarter, and then you go to zero, and then you keep going to negative 25, you didn't just ease by another 25 basis points. The evidence from Japan and Europe is that you're through the looking glass and you have very strange effects, really unintended consequences. I'll give you a couple examples. So the conventional theory is, Well, the more I cut interest rates, the more stimulus I get. That's a joke, but that's what they think. But if I go negative, you're absolutely going to go out and spend the money. Because if you don't spend the money, I'm going to take it away. You sit there long enough, you'll have nothing left in your bank account. Because I'm going to take, with these negative interest rates, I'm going to take it away. So people will run out and spend. And the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, from the lending point of view, they'll borrow money, you know, because the bank pays you to be a borrower. But here's what happens in the real world. This is the difference between academics and human beings. When people see negative interest rates, people have goals in mind. They have lifetime goals, right? They want a kid's education, parents' health care, their own health care, retirement. If you start taking their money away with negative rates, guess what they do? They save more. Like, hey, I got to put my kids through college. You're taking my money. Well, I better save more. And then what kind of signal is the central bank sending with negative interest rates? They're sending a deflationary signal. So people go, well, if, you're, if you think it's going to be deflation, I'm not going to spend money. I'll wait till the price comes down. So you're trying to encourage lending and spending. And what you get is more savings and no spending, deferred spending. You get the exact opposite of what you want. So again, another uh, egghead experiment gone awry. But the point being, so negative rates don't work. So zero bound really is zero. It really is a boundary. And, you know, Bernanke has said this in his recent writings, and and I think he's he's right about that. So back to the problem. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're at 75? Well, the answer is you can't. So you have to raise them to 300 basis points. So the problem the Fed is trying to solve is how do they get rates to three and a quarter percent before the next recession? Now, I'm not saying the Fed sees a recession, and that's easy because the Fed never sees a recession. In 102 years, the Fed has never seen a recession, never forecast a recession. But they know their economic history. We are eight years into an expansion. This is, it, it feels punk. I mean, the growth is anemic, but you know, labor force participation is low, productivity is dropping. There are a lot of bad things going on. But in fact, we are in the eighth year, actually coming up on, soon be entering the ninth year of an expansion, which began in June 2009. Right. By the way, you have a hard time convincing most Americans that we're not still in a recession. Depressions are different than recessions. You know, The technical definition of a recession is Two consecutive quarters of declining GDP with rising unemployment, a couple other bells and whistles, little subjective factors, but that's basically it. So people, when you say depression, they're like, huh, depression sounds worse than a recession. And if recession is two quarters of declining GDP, then a depression must be like 10 quarters of declining GDP because it's got to be worse. But that's not the definition. The definition of a depression, you can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend growth. In other words, if trend is three, three and a half, and you're actually banging out one and a half, two, that gap between, let's say, one and a half and three and a half percent growth, that's depressed growth. It's an output gap. It compounds over time and you never get it back. We are losing trillions of dollars of wealth. We are impoverishing future generations on a relative basis because of our inability to get back to trend growth. So the reason American people feel this and don't listen to the economists and they're right is because we're in a depression. So leaving that aside, the Fed at least understands the business cycle and the fact that the next recession, you know, they say they don't die of old age, but they do die. And we're getting closer to the next one. So they are in a desperate race to get rates up to three and a half percent before the next recession hits so they can cut them to get out of the recession. The question is, can you raise rates enough to cure the next recession without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? That's the dilemma. That's the finesse. My answer is no, they're not going to be able to do it, but they think they can. 
why are they in this box? Well, because Bernanke should have raised rates in 2010, 2011, in the early stages of the expansion, when the economy would have been much better able to bear it than it is now. Bernanke skipped a whole cycle. He skipped a whole rate increase cycle to pursue these wacky experiments and, you know, QE and zero interest rate policy and all that. I spoke to Bernanke about this and he used the word experiment. He said this was an experiment. He, you know, Bernanke made his academic reputation by studying the Great Depression, you know, in the wake of Friedman and Anna Schwartz and some others. But he, he was a great scholar of the Great Depression and he got his chance to kind of try out his theories. But what he told me was, he said, 30 years from now, some new Ben Bernanke, some young scholar will look back and tell us if we did a good job or not. We actually don't know right now. See, the, the Great Depression was, was really two technical recessions, 29 to 33 and then 1937, 38. But from 33 to 37, we had an expansion. But the whole thing was a depression because we never got out of it. You know, the stock market recovered the 1929 high in 1954. It was a long time to get back to even. But Bernanke's mantra was doing something is better than doing nothing. I completely disagree. It's better to do nothing if you don't know what you're doing. And this is really the monetary equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, doctors say, you know, first rule of being a doctor is first do no harm. Anyway, bottom line is by pursuing QE and zero interest rate policy, Bernanke failed to raise rates during the early stages of a cyclical expansion, which he should have done. If he had, if he had, the economy would have been just fine and we'd be able to cut them today, but he didn't. So Janet Yellen now has to make up for lost time. So that's the mission. But again, and this is what the market completely does not get. And the Wall Street economists don't get, nobody gets this because they see the Fed raising rates and they've done the correlations and the regressions back to World War II and they go, huh, Every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. So if the Fed's raising rates, the economy must be getting stronger. So bid up stock prices, et cetera. But that's like saying umbrellas cause rain. In other words, they've got the causality backwards. The Fed never leaves the economy, ever. The Fed follows the economy. So a normal business cycle looks like this. So you get a little expansion going and unemployment starts to go down and industrial capacity utilization starts to go up and inflation starts to go up. And the Fed's watching, 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 and then it keeps going. They go, oh, it's getting a little hot. We better raise rates. And they raise rates. But of course, they started too late. The expansion keeps going. Inflation keeps going up. Unemployment keeps going down. Then the economy starts to cool down. Unemployment goes up and then prices go down and the past utilization drops. And we get into a recession like, huh, we better cut. You know, and then they cut and cut and cut and cut. And then you hit the bottom and then you come out of it again. So think of that as like a nice, pretty sine wave, right? That's a business expansion, business contraction over and over. 30 or so times since the end of World War II, with the Fed always following the economy, never leading the economy. So all the big brands on Wall Street, they've got all this data and they say, well, every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. That has absolutely been true for like 30 times since the end of World War II. It is not true today. The reason it's not true today is because Bernanke skipped the cycle and they're playing catch up. For the first time since 1937, the Fed is tightening into weakness. That is a key thing to bear in mind. The Fed is tightening into weakness. They are not leading the economy to strength. They are not responding to strength, even though Wall Street thinks they are. And there's a great danger that they're actually going to cause the recession they're preparing to cure, as I mentioned. The Fed will raise rates 25 basis points four times a year from now until the middle of 2019 until they get them to three and a quarter percent. So like clockwork, every March, June, September, December, for 2017, 2018, into 2019, look for a Fed rate hike until they get to three and a quarter percent, at which point they'll be able to say, all right, now we're three and a quarter. If we have a recession tomorrow, we can cut them back down to zero again and get out of it. That'll be mission accomplished. Now, this is why I was sitting there in December, like, yep, they're going to raise them in March. And right now I'll tell your listeners they're going to raise them in June. There's your Fed response function. There's your baseline scenario. What are the exceptions to Fed rate hike. And under what conditions will they not raise rates? Because this, everything I just described to you, they've had in mind since March 2015 when Yellen took patience out of the statement. That was the end of forward guidance. And by the way, if you go back to 2015, you know, I said they're not going to raise rates all year and they weren't going to do the liftoff that people were looking for in March, June, September. 
and they didn't lift off in September because the Chinese rate exchange devaluation, the stock market fell out of bed August 2015. Finally, they raised them in December 2015. And Wall Street was ready for March. I said, no, in June, no, September, no. It wasn't until December 2016 that they raised them the second time. So obviously, there are conditions under which they don't raise rates, notwithstanding the baseline scenario. So what are those conditions? There are three. Well, four, actually. So if you see job creation below 75,000, that will cause them to pause. By the way, pause is the key word. If you go home through the speeches, you'll see the word pause in Dudley's recent remarks. Pause is the Fed's jargon for we're not going to raise rates. We got the gym scenario, which I took from the Fed as their scenario, or a technical recession. So, you know, we're going to know Friday what the first quarter GDP is. It's pretty close to negative, but I'm not saying we're in a recession now. We might be. But if you see a recession, they'll pause. See job creation below 75,000, they'll pause. By the way, that's a very low bar. You know, if you see a jobs report, see, this is the other thing that confuses Wall Street. You see a jobs report with 100,000 jobs. So Wall Street goes, oh, that report's really weak. The Fed's going to think twice. No, 75,000 is the number. Yellen told us that. It was in one of her speeches. You just have to be a geek like me and, and read all the speeches. So the third factor would be disinflation. So the Fed has this 2% inflation target. They missed it for six years. They're finally getting close to hitting it. By the way, I think the listeners know they use the uh, PCE core deflator year over year. There's PPI and CPI and core, not a bunch of inflation indices, but we know what they use. PCE core deflator year over year. That actually has been getting close to 2%. But if you see it turn around, if you see that gap down to like 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, then they will pause. The last condition for the pause is a disorderly decline in stock markets, more than 5%. If you see a six, seven, eight percent decline, so if the S&P went down 100 points, Fed doesn't care. Dow Jones goes down 1,000 points, Fed doesn't care. But beyond that, if you see the S&P start to go down 150 or the Dow start to go down 1,500 points, in a disorderly way. It looks a little scary. It looks like there's no bottom. It looks like if you see that, they'll pause. So the Fed is going to raise like clockwork four times a year for the next two and a half years, unless you see job creation below 75,000, disinflation, a technical recession. If you don't see one of those things, they're going to raise rates. And so right now, I don't see any of them. I mean, they could all happen, but it looks like, you know, growth is going to be positive. Job creation has been decent, you know, over 100,000. Disinflation is probably coming, but not quite here yet. And they'll want to see a couple months in a row. And the stock market's not crashing. So none of the pause conditions are in place. Therefore, they will raise rates. Simple. The U.S. is heading into recession and we may be in a recession. Everyone's like, wait a second. Yesterday, GDP was up 5%. And it was. That was the number for for the, uh, the, it was the first government estimate for the third quarter of uh, 2023. It was up 5%, but it was very heavy on consumption and very heavy on inventory. When uh, wholesalers and distributors build up inventory, that counts as GDP. Well, it's fine to build up inventory if people are buying the stuff, but if they don't buy the stuff and you're up to the rafters in inventory, you got to start writing it down. This is where you see, you know, you go to the gap and you get like 10 shirts and five pairs of jeans for 30 bucks. I mean, the inventory situation comes down to the consumer. Are people buying stuff? It looks like the consumer hit the brakes in August. Now the second quarter is July, August, September. Sometime around mid to late August, after two pretty strong months and they were strong, um, the, the, the consumers just hit the brakes. Now, they've done enough to make the third quarter strong, but going into the fourth quarter, they may just you know, not show up for the game. A couple of reasons for that. Number one is during the pandemic, you go back to 2020, 2021, what was going on? Well, starting with Trump in, uh, I think, June 2020, he gave everybody a $1,400 check. If, if you got a heartbeat, you got a check. And then Trump did it again in December 20. Uh, 2020, sorry, um, just before he left office, it was another $600 check. Biden comes in and says, well, I can top that. And Biden does in uh, February or uh, February 2021, right after he was sworn in, here comes another $1,600 check. And then when people got those checks, they saved a lot of it. So what happened in 2023? People drew down their savings. They, the savings rate got really low. Like They spent the savings they had they didn't make new savings. And then they turned to the credit cards and ran up their credit card balances. Well, 
that feels good for a while. But then if you're paying the minimum uh, and rolling over the balance and you're at your limit, your credit limit's used up and the interest rates are 20 percent, some of them are, some of them are 28 percent, you're going to double that balance in three years. Uh, so if you're like, oh, I'll just pay the minimum this month and I'll figure it out your balance is going up because the interest is compounding faster than you're paying it down at 25, you know, 20, 25%. So um, people are tapped down on the credit cards. They've used up their savings. They um, they're getting into a deeper hole because the interest is compounding faster than they can pay off the credit cards. Uh, and they're just back. And it's showing up in things like gasoline consumption is way down. The demand for gasoline is what economists call inelastic, meaning you just have to buy it no matter what the price is. You got to take the kids to school or get to work or go shut, whatever it is. You're just going to buy the gasoline, even if you don't like the price. By the way, lately, price has been coming down a little bit, which is another that sounds good, but it's actually a bad sign because it's disinflationary, which kind of leans in the direction of a uh, recession. But um, for gasoline consumption to drop, forgetting about the price, that means people are not driving. They're not going on vacation. They're not doing road trips. They're not driving any more than they have to. There are a lot of other signs. We don't have time to get into all the all the technicals with the you know negative uh, swap spreads and uh, inverted yield curves and, and all the rest. But uh, it does look like the consumer slammed on the brakes around late August, early September. The fourth quarter could be a disaster. The stock market's starting to wake up to that fact. So I would say it's a pretty simple uh, recommendation, Matt. Reduce your exposure to stocks overall. Increase your exposure to cash. It'll give you, uh, you won't lose money on cash, um, assuming that inflation is not bad. And it'll give you a lot of optionality. You know, you can go, if things get really, really, really bad, if you have cash, you can go shopping and find some bargains. But uh, if you're in stocks and they go bad, you're just going to lose that money and never see it again. Um and uh, but if you if you do have a, if you do have stocks or some stocks, I would look at uh, energy, defense, um, not, not for good reasons, there's enough wars going on, but defense will do well and mining because, uh, um, you know, gold and silver prices and strategic minerals will do well. So defense, mining and um, uh, energy are the sectors I'd be in. I'd, I'd lighten up on tech, get out of everything else, go to cash. Uh, treasury notes look attractive here because interest rates are going to start to come down. They, I know they've been going up. I get it. But it looks like they've peaked and have turned around. So treasury notes, a good two-year note, a five-year note, will perform very well. And they're very safe, obviously. Um, and uh, and just take it from there. But you've got to be... You've got to be tuned into the geopolitics to understand the stock market. You can treat them as separate subjects, but if the world's falling apart, so I, that's not good for stocks. Right. So when we say bond markets, Matt, we have to be careful which bond market. I'm talking about the U.S. Treasury bond market. Um, you know, the short term treasuries, you know, four month bills, six month bills up to one year. The funny thing now is that the highest yields in the U.S. Treasury market are in like a six month bill. Like, wait a second. You know, shouldn't, shouldn't I get more if I buy a 30 year bond or shouldn't I get more if I buy a 10 year note? Um, it's a longer maturity, more stuff can happen, inflation, bank freezes. All those things can happen. I want a higher interest rate for my longer term security. That's usually the way the yield curve looks. It's kind of goes, it's upward sloping. The longer the maturity, the higher the rate. That's not true today. The highest maturities are right around um, six month bills, one year bills, going out to two year notes. When you get to the 10 year note, um, you actually get a lower interest rate, lower what's called yield to maturity than you do on a two year note. The interesting thing about two years, is you get a high rate, uh, but it's less volatile than a 10-year note. Uh, it's more liquid. Uh, I mean, 10-year notes are pretty liquid, but, but two-year notes are very liquid. Um, so you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can have a shorter maturity, which means less risk in some ways, and a higher interest rate. So it's, like, like I said, the best of both worlds. But the highest interest rate is actually from six months to one year. So those are very, very safe security securities and they're paying like five and a quarter, you know, uh, not quite five and a half, but you know, well between five and a quarter and five and a half percent for six months, for a six month treasury bill. Why wouldn't you just buy one of those? I mean, it's more than what you get in the bank. Now the answer is, um, well, yeah, Jim, that sounds good. But if interest rates go up even more, you're going to lose money on, on your capital. The, the value of the note or bond will go down if interest rates go up. That's that's bond math 101. You know, rates go up, prices go down. The opposite is true. Rates go down, prices go up. So you can make or lose money, but that 
inverse relationship kind of throws a lot of people, but that's just how it works. So yeah, buying a two-year note that yields about 5.1%, very liquid, very safe, uh, good return, more than your bank will pay you, more than most stocks will pay you. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? Well, the answer is, if you think the two-year note is going to go to 6%, you might not like it because you're going to, you know, if you hold it for two years, you'll get your money back. But if you want to sell in the meantime, you're going to lose, you're going to have a capital loss on the note itself. So, so therefore, the next level of analysis is, well, what's going to happen to interest rates? Everybody wants to know that. Um, in my view, they've peaked. Um, they're going to come down. Uh, and if you like that action, you might prefer the 10-year note because uh, a longer maturity has a higher, you know, not to get too technical, it's called DBO1, dollar value, one basis point. What it means is that, so interest rates come down a certain amount, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points or whatever. And I said, bond prices go up, which they do, but how much do they go up? Well, the answer is the longer the maturity, the more they go up, they're more volatile. And so um, to your notes, a really attractive piece of paper, very safe, you get your money back, uh, liquid, you can get out of it, et cetera. You know, the only reason not to buy would be if you thought rates were going to go up. I don't. I think they're coming down from here on out. But uh, if you accept that view, then the 10-year note is going to have the biggest capital gains. Now, again, it's riskier. When I say risky, I'm talking about market risk. I'm not talking about credit risk. You are going to get your money back. But from a, but from a market risk point of view, if you had to sell it you know, a year from now or six months from now, for that matter, uh, if rates go up, you're going to lose a little money on the um, on the value of the note itself. But uh, but if rates come down, not only do you get the 5% interest rate, which is sweet, but you're going to have a capital gain on the note because that's what happens when rates come down. So the big question is, have rates peaked? And I would say they have. And I base that on what I said earlier about the economy. If we're going into a recession, we're going into a slowdown. We're looking at all kinds of geopolitical risks, stocks are coming down, then interest rates are going to come down too. 